You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be a time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you'll be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. A woman wants to find out about a paragliding course. Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully, and answer questions one to seven. Nice. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? Well, we've got the introductory course, which lasts for two days. Okay. Or there's the four-day beginners course, which is what most people do first. I'd tend to recommend that one. And there's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days, depending on conditions. We might try the beginners course. What sort of prices are we looking at? The introductory is one hundred and ninety dollars. The beginners course, which is probably what you'd be looking at, is three hundred and twenty dollars. No, sorry, three hundred and thirty. It's just gone up, and the pilot course is four hundred and thirty dollars. Right. And you also have to become a member of our club so that you're insured. That'll cost you twelve dollars a day. Everyone has to take out insurance, you see. Does that cover me if I break a leg? No, I'm afraid not. It's only third party and covers you against damage to other people or their belongings, but not theft or injury. You would need to take out your own personal accident insurance. I see. And what's the best way to get to your place? By public transport, or could we come by bike? We're pretty keen cyclists. It's difficult by public transport, though there is a bus from Newcastle. Most people get here by car, though, because we're a little off the beaten track. But you could ride here, okay? I'll send you a map. Just let me take down a few details. What's your name? Maria Gentle. And your address, Maria? Well, I'm a student staying with a family in Newcastle. So it's care of. Care of Mr. and Mrs. McDonald. Like the hamburgers. <laughs> yes, exactly. McDonald. The post office box address is probably best. It's P.O. Box six seven six Newcastle. Is there a fax number there? Because I could fax you the information. Yes, actually there is. It's o two four nine. That's for Newcastle, and then double seven five four three one. Okay. Now, if you decide to do one of our courses, you'll need to book in advance and to pay when you book. How would you be paying?、Uh, by credit card, if that's okay. Do you take Visa? Yes, fine. We take all major cards, including Visa. Okay then. Thanks very much. The girl is telling her friend about the course. Look at questions eight to ten.
Now listen to their conversation and answer questions eight to ten. Hi, Pauline. Hi, Maria. What's that you're reading? Just some information from a paragliding school. It looks really good fun. Do you fancy a go at paragliding? Sure. Do you have to buy lots of equipment and stuff? Not really. The school provides the equipment, but we'd have to take a few things along, such as. Well, it says here, clothes.、Uh, wear stout boots, so no sneakers or sandals, I suppose, and clothes suitable for an active day in the hills. Preferably a long-sleeved T-shirt. That's probably in case you land in the stinging nettles. It also says we should bring a packed lunch. We do not recommend soft drinks or flasks of coffee. <laughs> Water is really the best thing to drink.、Uh, we need to bring suntan lotion and something to protect your head from the sun. Okay, that sounds reasonable. And where would we stay? Well, look. They seem to operate a campsite too, because it says here that it's only ten dollars a day to pitch a tent. That'd be fine, wouldn't it? And that way would save quite a bit, because even a cheap hotel would cost money. Uh, or perhaps we could stay in a bed and breakfast nearby. It gives a couple of names here we could ring. I think I might prefer that. <laughs>、uh, hotels and youth hostels would all be miles away from the farm, and I don't fancy a caravan. No, I agree. But let's take a ten and pray for good weather. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> What about next weekend? No, I can't. I'm going on a geography field trip. And then it's the weekend before the exams, and I really do need to study. Okay then, let's make it the one after the exams. Fine. We'll need a break by then. Can you ring and let me know if you can find out? That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a reporter talking on the radio about old racing cars. First, look at questions eleven to sixteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to sixteen. The Goodwood Museum is currently celebrating some of the most extravagant types of car design in its Festival of Speed. Here is our reporter Vincent Freed, who is on site to tell us about some of the cars on display. Well, here I am standing in front of one of the most prestigious cars ever built, the Duesenberg. A fantastically expensive, luxurious car built in the early part of the 20th century and bearing all the glamorous qualities of the Jazz Age. How many were there? Well, only 473 Duesenberg J-types were ever built, and the model here is one of the rarest. Each had a short 125-inch chassis or framework, and the body was always in the form of an open two-seater. The technology behind the car's 6.9-liter engine was extraordinary. It featured capsules of mercury in the engines to absorb vibration and provide an incredibly smooth ride. In fact, these cars offered unparalleled performance. In an age when 160 kilometers per hour was considered very fast, the Duesenberg promised a top speed of 180 kilometers per hour. And could do 140 kilometers per hour in second gear. Duesenberg, who designed the car, sold it as a frame and engine. 
This was typical of the age again, and many prestige manufacturers such as Rolls-Royce did exactly the same. Owners able to afford the hefty $9,000 price tag for the basic car would then commission a coachwork company to build a body tailored to their own individual requirements. The Duesenberg's great attraction for the driver was its instrument panel, which offered all the usual features, but also several others, including a stopwatch. It was the Duesenberg's technology that lay behind its success as a racing car, and they dominated the American racing scene in the 1920s, winning the Indianapolis Grand Prix in 1924, 25 and 27. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. On to another celebrity, the 1922 Leia Helica. Only 30 of these French propeller cars were built, and the model here at Goodwood, which was the fourth to be made, is thought to be the only surviving example still capable of running. The brains behind this car was Marcel Leia who was an aviation pioneer first and foremost, and the influence of flying is quite apparent in the car. The layer very strongly resembles a light aircraft with its front propeller, but in this case, it's minus any wings, of course. It's quite odd to think that this car was whirring through France just as the Duesenberg was blasting down roads at 160 kilometers per hour across the Atlantic. The layers were used regularly in France in the 1920s, and were even produced in saloon and van form, as well as two-seater. The layer matched its propeller drive with its equally bizarre steering, which used the rear rather than the front wheels. But despite looking rather frail, it was a tough machine. In fact, when troops tried to steal it during the Second World War, the car's baffling design was clearly beyond the would-be thieves, and it ended up being driven into a tree, breaking the propeller. And now for the Firebird. This extraordinary car was first... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear two students, Frank and Nicole, discussing their research on university waste. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi Nicole. As you know, we've got to decide on the best ways this university can reduce its waste. You inspected the eastern campus and I did the western buildings. Did you do all the interviews as well? Yes, I interviewed all the staff who made some good observations and I interviewed some of the students. The students said little that was interesting. They don't seem to care that much. It was the cleaners, surprisingly, who revealed the most relevant facts. That's not surprising to me. They empty all the bins so they see the waste firsthand, whereas the staff just throw things away without thinking. 
What item was most commonly disposed of? Well, it really depended on where I interviewed. In the cafeteria precinct, obviously paper plates and cups were thrown away all over the place. There was almost no attempt at recycling. However, across the university in general, it was paper copying that filled up most bins, far more than plastic or other forms of waste. Do people care about this then? Well, some do, if you can believe them. I must have interviewed about thirty percent of customers in the cafeteria, and the results were mixed. Out of all the people I interviewed, well over half, maybe about fifty-five percent of them, were quite honest about it, telling me that they had little concern. The other fraction, forty-five percent, were more troubled. Yes, but do they do anything about it? Surprisingly, quite a significant percentage do do something, even if they aren't particularly concerned. I mean, small things. About ten percent bring their own cups to the cafeteria, for example, and at least one third said they use recycling bins. So, in total, it's an equal split between those who do something or those who don't. So, why do so many people remain inactive, particularly over an issue they should care about more? I think they do care, and many of them are prepared to do something. Obviously, there's an element of laziness. But I'd say that it's relatively small. If they knew what to do, and if stringent systems existed, or if the importance of this was made clearer to them, I'm sure you'd see a much larger percentage of people actively working towards helping our environment. Well, there's cause for optimism at least. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Clearly, then, there's a significant waste of paper here at this university. So I've worked out one practical suggestion which could help reduce it. Specifically, the waste from the excess photocopying. Let me hear it then. Ah, obviously, for a start, we've got to ensure that people, including the staff, without exception, copy both sides of a page. We can't tolerate single-sided copying. It's just far too wasteful. Absolutely, just more trees being chopped down. But as people are doing copying, there may be adjustments and practice copying, producing single-sided copies or blank pages not wanted and not intended for use. These need to be deposited into a tray for intended recycling. You know, for recopying onto the blank side of the page. But people don't usually do that. I'm afraid it's just human nature. No matter how unimportant the copying is, they prefer to use fresh paper. Yeah, I agree with you. Which is why you need to display these papers right in front of everyone with a clear sign: "Please reuse" to make it easy for them to do so. They still won't do it. I know. That's why you take some of these papers and regularly stack them inside the copier in a special tray once a day, say in the morning. Well, that's getting better, making it easier for them to use the paper. But still, I'm afraid many won't. That's why you allow everyone to select this tray when copying. You distribute numbers or codes to every person, giving them special access to this recycling tray. Every time they use papers from this, it's tallied up to their account. I know I'm sounding a bit negative or even cynical here, but why should they bother using that tray? Because the person who does the most copying from this recycling tray gets, say, a cinema pass or lottery ticket or some other sort of reward. Ah,、oh, right. Now that's a system which might just work. Let's trial it in the office and see what happens. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecturer talking about dust storms. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 36. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. In the last lecture, we looked at the adverse effects of desert dust on global climate. Today, we're going to examine more closely what causes dust storms and what other effects they can have. As you know, dust storms have always been a feature of desert climates, but what we want to focus on today is the extent to which human activity is causing them. And it's this trend that I want to look at, because it has wide-ranging implications. So, what are these human activities? Well, there are two main types that affect the wind erosion process, and thus the frequency of dust storms. There are activities that break up naturally wind-resistant surfaces, such as off-road vehicle use and construction. And there are those that remove protective vegetation cover from soils, for example, mainly farming and drainage. In many cases, the two effects occur simultaneously, which adds to the problem. Let's look at some real examples and see what I'm talking about. Perhaps the best known example of agricultural impact on desert dust is the creation of the USA's Dust Bowl in the 1930s. The dramatic rise in the number of dust storms during the latter part of that decade was the result of farmers mismanaging their land. In fact, choking dust storms became so commonplace that the decade became known as the Dirty Thirties. Researchers observed a similar but more prolonged increase in dustiness in West Africa between the 1960s and the 1980s, when the frequency of the storms rose to 80 a year and the dust was so thick that visibility was reduced to a thousand meters. This was a hazard to pilots and road users. In places like Arizona, the most dangerous dust clouds are those generated by dry thunderstorms. Here, this type of storm is so common that the problem inspired officials to develop an alert system to warn people of oncoming thunderstorms. When this dust is deposited, it causes all sorts of problems for machine operators. It can penetrate the smallest nooks and crannies and play havoc with the way things operate because most of the dust is made up of quartz, which is very hard. Another example. The concentration of dust originating from the Sahara has risen steadily since the mid-1960s. This increase in wind erosion has coincided with a prolonged drought which has gripped the Sahara's southern fringe. Drought is commonly associated with an increase in dust-raising activity, but it's actually caused by low rainfall, which results in vegetation dying off. In the second part, the speaker talks about the drying up of the Aral Sea. Look at questions 37 to 40. One of the foremost examples of modern human-induced environmental degradation is the drying up of the Aral Sea in Central Asia. Its ecological demise dates from the 1950s, 
when intensive irrigation began in the then Central Asian republics of the USSR. This produced a dramatic decline in the volume of water entering the sea from its two major tributaries. In 1960, the Aral Sea was the fourth largest lake in the world, but since that time it has lost two-thirds of its volume. Its surface area has halved, and its water level has dropped by more than 216 meters. A knock-on effect of this ecological disaster has been the release of significant new sources of wind-blown material as the water level has dropped. And the problems don't stop there. The salinity of the lake has increased so that it is now virtually the same as seawater. This means that the material that is blown from the dry bed of the Aral Sea is highly saline. Scientists believe it is adversely affecting crops around the sea because salts are toxic to plants. This shows that dust storms have numerous consequences beyond their effects on climate, both for the workings of environmental systems and for people living in dry lands. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Set again. It's a red skin.